one, I hope that you've had a wonderful afternoon of rest. The Lord blessed us with a beautiful afternoon, and I hope that you were able to enjoy uh, some of the sunshine this afternoon. I want to welcome you back to our time of uh, worship via the internet, and I want to begin by reading out of the book of Psalms, Psalm 135. It says, praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Give praise of servants of the Lord who stand in the house of the Lord and in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel, as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the depths. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. Blessed be the Lord from Zion, he who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Well, let us have a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we do come to you tonight again, wanting to lift up your name and praise you, Lord. We thank you that you have given us this opportunity, this day, to worship you. We thank you for life. We thank you for the hope and the anchor that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for the technology that you've blessed us with, that while we're not able to meet in person corporately, we can still meet together um, through the internet. We thank you. So, Lord, we just ask that as we meet tonight, we gather to worship you, that you would be honored above everything, that your great name would be exalted, Give us the ears and the understanding to understand your word. Lord, we just ask that you'd speak to us tonight. I pray that you'd speak to us words of comfort and peace. Lord, if we need to be challenged in our walk with you, I pray that you would use your word to challenge us, help us to be honest. And certainly, Lord, if there is anyone who is uh, listening tonight who does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray, Holy Spirit, that be, tonight will be the night that they are confronted with the reality of their sins, that they will be confronted with the reality of eternity, but they will understand that there is hope in Christ and that they would turn to you by faith. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
Praise the Lord. We serve the great and mighty God. And as God's people, our praise is not confined to a building. We uh, have the blessing, the privilege of being able to praise God at all times. No matter where we're at, we have the, uh, the great opportunity to praise God for his goodness and his um, grace. Well, tonight it is my privilege once again to be able for a few moments to go back to God's Word where um, God wants to speak to us. I believe He has a message for us tonight out of the book of Philippians. I, I was praying this afternoon about where the Lord would have us go this evening uh, to just glean from Him the message that He had for us. And He brought to, to, to my heart a message that um, I had preached not long ago on a, on a Sunday evening, but uh, I just felt like the, the message was, was very applicable to where we're at uh, tonight as a, as a nation and as a, a community. So if you have a copy of God's Word at your home, wherever you're at, I want to invite you to turn to the New Testament book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9 is where we're going to be at tonight. If you, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, the, the words will be on the screen behind me that you can follow along as, as we look at this, uh, this beautiful text that the, the Lord gives us. Most of us possess something that is um, very aggravating, but also something very important and necessary and that is keys. We have to have keys. Um, and I don't know if you're, you're like me, but oftentimes I misplace my keys. And, and when that happens, um, I frantically go looking for my keys, especially if, if it's my car keys or the keys to my office. Uh, but, you know, at, at the house, I can show you a handful of locks, very nice locks, that I can no longer use because I've lost keys to those uh, locks, so they're, they're useless. And so tonight I want to talk about keys tonight, some very important keys. In fact, tonight I want to talk about four keys that uh, Paul in the book of Philippians gives us that will unlock for us the peace of God. And so I want to read the text, again just follow along as I, as I read this, and as we look at these four keys to unlocking the peace of God. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. The Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, John chapter 14, verse 27, he shared these familiar words where he said, Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And so, in that verse, Jesus gives us a wonderful promise, a promise that as God's people, we can have the peace of God no matter what we walk through and, and face in life. For all who have experienced, the, uh, who have peace with God through salvation, through faith in Jesus Christ, can experience the peace of God. What is this peace that Jesus promises to us? Peace is not the absence of conflict, but rather peace is something that you can have in the midst of your conflict. Peace is, is a, another word for rest 
or it's when you have a confident assurance or a calmness in your soul as you walk through difficult times. But the sad reality is, is that there are many today and even many professing Christians who do not experience the peace of God in their daily lives. And that is sad and that is troubling because when we are not experiencing the peace of God, oftentimes in, in place of peace, we will have fear and anger. And oftentimes we will face depression and insecurity and even a feeling of this overwhelming sense of hopeless, hopelessness. So it's very important that we understand how we can experience the peace of God no matter what trial or tribulation we may face. And so tonight I want to offer us four keys that will help us as God's people to unlock the peace of God. And I must say that the peace of God is something that the Lord wants us to have. It's not something that He wants to withhold from us or He's hiding from us. There are four keys that we must understand if, as God's children, we're going to experience that confidence, that assurance, that calmness as we walk through the difficulties of life. And so the first key that our text points out to us comes in verse 4 and verse 5, and that is simply believing the right way. Believing the right way. If you want to experience, if you want to have the peace of God, you must believe the right way. The truth is, is that what we believe matters. And what we believe must measure up, must be based on the Word of God, God's Word. As I said this morning, if you listen to our, our service this morning, we have all kinds of information coming to us, especially in these days in which we live. And not all of the information that we receive can be trusted. But one thing is for sure, God's Word will never mislead us. It is truth. And so what we believe must be built on God's Word. It cannot, our belief cannot be based upon what the world says nor can our belief, the belief that we cling to, the belief that we trust in, cannot be based upon our feelings or our emotions. Certainly, feelings and emotions are given to us by the Lord, but we have to be careful because our feelings and our emotions, if we're not careful, will mislead us. And so we must believe the right way. Sadly, there's a lots of people, even some Christians, who they don't experience the peace of God because they don't believe correctly. And so Paul here tells us some, some things regarding belief. First of all, in verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. So what does that tell us? That tells us that when we believe correctly, the result, the, the outcome in our lives will be joy. When you believe correctly, when your belief is grounded in God's Word, the, the result of that is going to be joy in your life. And again, joy is not predicated on our circumstances. It's not like happiness. There are times that we go through things that um, keep us from being happy. But joy is something that is never determined by our circumstances. And so when we believe we're right, when our beliefs are grounded in God's Word, when they come from the Word of God, when they're informed by the truth of God's Word, we will experience joy. But Paul tells us something else in regards to believing right, and that's in verse 5, where he tells us that believing right produces security. It produces stability. Again, he says in verse 5, Let your reasonableness or your gentleness be made known to everyone. And he says something. He, he mentions a truth here that is very important. He says, The Lord is at hand. Tonight, 
because of what God tells us in his word, we know and we believe that the Lord is at hand. Now, what exactly did Paul mean when he said the Lord is at hand? Perhaps he was referring to the nearness of Christ's return. We, we know uh, as Christians that the hope that serves as the anchor of our souls is knowing that one day Christ is going to come again. But I believe that Paul here is not referencing so much to the nearness of Christ's return, but he is simply telling us that we do not serve a God that is a distant God, that God is near to us. He is amongst us. He is present with us. Again, he is, he's not some distant God that, that uh, doesn't care about us or is, or is not concerned about the details of our lives. But our belief by faith tells us that he is near to us, that he is present with us. And that truth brings peace, knowing that we are never alone. We we saw that in this morning's message as the disciples were in that boat and they faced that storm. The Lord was with them in the midst of the storm. And so no matter what situation you face, no matter what uncertainty you face, no matter what difficulty, hardship you face, you can have peace by believing correctly, believing that God is near to us, that God is with us. Well, secondly, he gives us another key that will help us to unlock the peace of God in our lives. And that comes in the latter part of verse 5 into verse 7. And that is simply praying the right way. So number one, believing the right way. But then number two, Paul's, Paul tells us that we must pray correctly, praying the right way. Again, he says, the Lord is at hand. Therefore, if the Lord is present with us, if the Lord is near to us, then he is always available to us regarding prayer. His ear is always open to the cries of his children. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in time of need. Did you hear what Paul said there? Let us then with confidence, or your translation may say, let us then with boldness draw near to the throne of grace. The, the wonderful privilege of being a child of God is, is that we have direct access to God Almighty through Jesus Christ. And he gives a command here. He says, the Lord is at hand, therefore do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So he gives a command here. This is not an option. Paul is not saying, I want you to pray about this and consider this. Think about not being anxious about anything. No, that's not what he says. But with apostolic authority, Paul says, do not be anxious at all. Do not fret or worry. But instead of wasting your time and your energy on fretting and worrying about things that you cannot change, instead spend that time in prayer. Prayer is the key to having and experiencing His peace. And so there are some things that we must understand regarding our prayer. If we're going to pray right, we, we must pray with the right frequency. Other places in the scripture speak about prayer, and certainly we're not going to look at all those verses. We, we could be here all night if we looked at all the verses the Bible tells us about prayer. But I want to share with you a couple of these verses. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. In other words, we're to always be in the mindset of prayer. And then I, I love this verse. One of my favorite verses comes out of 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So we must pray with the right frequency. We must pray consistently, regularly. And so what do we pray for? 
when we pray for strength as believers, we consistently go to the Lord and we acknowledge our need for Him. Lord, would you give me the strength? Would you help me to tap into that divine resource that is all already available to me? Because I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me. Lord, help me to rely upon the strength that is outside of me in order to face life. Lord, give me the courage to face the uncertainties of life. Lord, help me in my faith. Lord, use this time in my life. May I not, may I not waste this opportunity to grow in my faith. Lord, help me to be humble. Help me to daily acknowledge my need for you. Lord, I, I pray for protection. Lord, would you, would you please protect me physically? And certainly we must pray that the Lord will protect us spiritually. May we not forget that we are in a spiritual battle. While our physical eyes cannot see the warfare that is happening all around us, we know from the Word of God, like in Ephesians chapter 6, that we have an adversary, we have an enemy, and he seeks to do everything he can to oppose us, to, to weaken our influence on the world. And certainly, in times of difficulty, uh, that is when he will oftentimes attack us. And so we must daily, regularly, Pray to the Lord for protection. We certainly must pray for one another. When you look at the, the prayer life of the Apostle Paul in, in his epistles, you see the nature, the makeup of Paul's prayer life. He was always praying for his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But what's interesting is when you look at the, the nature of those, those prayers, it was always on, on the eternal things of life. Uh, he, he prayed for his, for his uh, fellow brothers and sisters, that they would be strong in the Lord, that they would, they would have a heavenly focus, that their eyes would stay upon the Lord. And that is what we must pray for one another. Certainly in our immediate situation, we should pray for a, for a vaccine, for a cure to be found to this uh, disease. And while we're praying for that, we also pray with the understanding that we want the Lord's will to be done, Lord, we, we ask that, that your purpose and your plan would be accomplished in this situation. Uh, Lord, we pray for our leaders. Lord, would you give our, our leaders the wisdom that they need? This is not a time to use this as an opportunity to attack our leaders. This is a time we must pray on their behalf. We are commanded in the scriptures. In Timothy, we're told to, to pray for our governing authorities. And certainly we want to pray for our doctors and all those who are working in the medical industry, praying for their protection, praying for, for a supernatural strength uh, for, for them. And certainly we must regularly, no matter what is going on in life, we must regularly pray for the lost. May we be faithful to, to pray for individuals by name. That, we, that we're not sure they have any evidence in their life that Jesus Christ is the Lord of their lives. The Lord wants us to call out to Him on their behalf. Here at First Baptist Church, we, we are um, in the midst of, a, of something called Who's Your One? And so we're praying for that one individual that God has placed upon our hearts, that, that we're concerned about their salvation. And so may we consistently, no matter what's happening in life, to pray for the lost. I heard something the other day regarding prayer. Um, we're all trying to wash our hands regularly. And we want to do that right. We want to, we want to wash our hands in warm water. Sort of, we want to use soap and do it for 20 seconds at least. But as you're praying, every time or every time you wash your hands, use that as an opportunity to pray. Pray about the different needs the Lord puts upon your heart. So praying the right way means to pray with the right frequency. But Paul also tells us that if we're going to pray right, we must pray with the right attitude. Notice he says, But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Notice Paul says, he doesn't say, As you're praying, use that as an opportunity to complain to God about your situation. But that's not what Paul says. He says, Pray with thanksgiving in all things. And so no matter what we face in life, when we pray, 
We can always pray with thanksgiving. As believers, we must never fail to thank Him for our salvation. Do you realize that if it, is, if it were not for God's amazing grace, none of us would have any hope. But it is because of His grace and His grace alone that we can say with confident assurance that we are saved. And so we can say, Lord, thank you so much that uh, I, as I'm going through this, I know that I am saved. Lord, thank you that this has not taken you by surprise, that, that you are bigger than this problem, that you have a plan and a purpose for this situation in my life. And Lord, no matter how you see fit to, to work out this situation in my life, I'm going to trust you. And I trust that no matter what you allow to happen in my life, your grace is absolutely efficient, uh, sufficient to carry me through no matter what. And so pray in the right way. And then notice what he says in verse 7 will be the result when, when we are, when we are uh, resolved to not be anxious, but instead to pray about everything. With the right attitude, the result comes in verse 7. And the peace of God, not the peace of the world, not a, not a false hope, but the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it's a peace that we can't fully explain, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And so Paul is, is just saying there that the result of praying the right way as a, as a child of God is that our inner person, will be guarded by God from anxiety and doubt and fear and worry. This is a promise that, that are made to those who are in Christ Jesus. The world, they can't understand this peace. And they cannot experience this peace because they're outside of Christ. So two keys so far that we have we have learned about that will unlock the peace of God in the hearts of those of us who know the Lord. Believing the right way. Number two, praying the right way. But number three in verse eight, the third key that unlocks the peace of God in our lives is thinking the right way. Paul speaks of the mind in this verse, in verse eight. And scripture teaches us that a large part of winning the battle as believers takes place in the mind. It is in the mind, those things that we think on. Listen to these verses that speak of the importance of guarding our minds as believers. 2 Corinthians 10.5 Take every thought captive to obey Christ. And then Romans 12.2, perhaps a more familiar verse, and don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then in Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then finally, Ephesians 4, 23, says, Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. So again, if we're, if we're going to have peace as we walk through this life, we must think correctly. We must think right. And so Paul here in verse 8, he just he gives this list of, of virtues or standards that will help us to guard the way that we think. He says, think on those things that are true, true as to fact. So we must be careful that we, we filter the information that comes into our minds. Don't, don't let what the world says through the news, social media, whatever uh, vehicle information comes to you. Don't, don't let the world, what the world says, bring deception into your life. Paul says, think on those things that are true, that come from the Word of God. Think on those things that are, that are noble. In other words, fill your mind with thoughts that are honorable thoughts. 
thoughts that are worthy of respect, those things that are worthy of awe and adoration. A great way that we can do that, that we fill our minds with noble thoughts, is by getting into the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms was, a, was an Old Testament hymnal of worship where the people would just sing praises uh, to God. And so as you, as you read the Psalms throughout the day, fill your mind with noble thoughts, thoughts of awe and adoration towards God Almighty. He says, think on those things that are just, those things that are right. In other words, think on those things, think on thoughts that, that God would approve of. Think on those things that are pure. In other words, don't ponder, don't, don't fill your mind with morally unclean and, and defiled things. Guard your mind from the filth of the world. He says to think on those things that are lovely. Think on those things that, specifically when he says lovely, think on those things that have to do with uh, relationships. The, the most lovely person that has ever existed is Jesus Christ. And so we must frequently think about the gospel and the truth of the gospel and how the gospel impacts our lives each and every day. Think on those things that are of good report, Paul says. Think about the good that we see in others, is what he's saying. Don't, don't dwell on the faults and, and the negative qualities of one another. Instead, think on those positive and commendable things about one another. And then the final two um, virtues here are, are really kind of generic terms, qualities, that sum up the preceding qualities where he says, think on those things as of virtue, those things of excellence, and those things that are praiseworthy. And so having the peace of God involves thinking the right way. As the old saying goes, you are what you think. Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So, so the things that we put into our minds are going to greatly influence what comes out of our lives. And so just as a suggestion, um, perhaps we should have a fast, but then have a feast. And what do I mean by that? Well, why we, we don't want to live life in denial. We don't, we don't want to live life with our heads stuck in the ground. We, we have to live informed lives. But perhaps we need to, to limit what we read as, and watch as far as the news and social media, especially during these, these days. So perhaps we need to have a fast from all that kind of information, but instead have a feast, feasting instead on the Word of God. Where will our strength come from? Our strength will come from truth. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. So thinking the right way. And then number four, and finally, in verse 9, he gives us the fourth key for unlocking the peace of God, and that is living the right way. Living the right way. Again, Paul says in verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul here is writing this letter to the church at Philippi. He had spent much time with those believers at Philippi, and they had watched the way that Paul lived. They had heard about the, the, the reputation of the Apostle Paul. And so Paul says, all those things that you have that you have personally witnessed in my life, those things that you hear about me, how I'm living my life. Imitate those things. Now, don't misunderstand what Paul is saying here. Paul is not bragging. He's not being arrogant. He's just very confident that he was walking in the will of the Lord, that his life was well-pleasing to the Lord, and therefore his life set a good example for others to pattern their own lives after. He said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, where he said, imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. So that's the key there. Paul was, 
He wasn't just saying, imitate me for the sake of imitating me, but imitate me because I am imitating Christ, and Christ is our ultimate example of how we should live as believers in Jesus Christ. The reality of the gospel is this. Being saved is not just having an intellectual knowledge of the Bible. It's not just knowing about Jesus in your mind. But knowing Jesus Christ in a personal way means that you are a follower of Christ. Therefore, the way that you live is impacted by your relationship to Christ. A gospel that does not change an individual is a gospel that is not worth having. But we know that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And therefore, when we are saved, the Spirit of God comes to live inside of us. And therefore, it impacts the way that we live. And because we have the Spirit of God living inside of us, we can live lives that bring honor and glory to the Lord. The way that we live is not what earns our salvation, but the way that we live decides to what extent we will benefit from our salvation. What I mean by that is, as a child of God, if we've truly been saved, if Christ lives in us, and we are not living according to the Word of God, some things will be robbed from us in our lives. We will rob ourselves of the peace of God. Because in the life of a believer, if we're living in sin, one of the things that the enemy will use is he will use that as a way to attack our assurance. And the most miserable place to be as a child of God is to, is to be saved, but not to have the assurance that you are saved. And when we live in sin, let's understand, none of us are perfect. There is only one who is perfect, and his name is Jesus. But we are all to be growing in Christ's likeness. Peter said, to be holy, for I am holy, referring to the Lord God Almighty. So none of us are perfect. We, we mess up every day. But it should be the, the intent of our hearts and our lives that we want to, to live in such a way that is honoring and pleasing to the Lord. Psalm 66, verse 18. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So that tells us that sin and the life of a believer must be taken very, very serious. Because sin robs us, again, of the peace of God, which Paul speaks of here. So we must be guarded that we not indulge in sin. We must be careful that we don't hide Sin. You know, one of the tricks of the devil, he's so deceptive, and he will whisper in our ear that we can live in sin secretly and get away with it. But that is a lie. That is a deception. And I just wonder tonight, maybe tonight you are sitting here as one, and you're listening to this, and the Spirit of God right now is confronting you because you have something in your life that you know is dishonoring to the Lord. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's some kind of behavior. Maybe it's some kind of an addiction in your life. And you know that it is dishonoring to the Lord. And one of the ways that you know it is because you don't have the peace of God in your life. And so we must confess our sin regularly and consistently. And we must turn from our sin. You know, confession and repentance are two different things. I can acknowledge to God, I can confess to God that I have a problem with lying or stealing or whatever the sin may be. I can confess it all day long. But that is different than turning from our sin. God wants us to not only confess, acknowledge, take ownership of our sin, but He wants us to repent of our sin. That means that on a daily basis we acknowledge our sin, but also we say, by your strength, Lord, I'm going to stop doing this particular sin. So, again, in the way of review, four keys for unlocking the peace of God. So important for the days in which we live. So important for every day in life. Again, you, you might be facing something that is, uh, that is very troubling to you, and you need the peace of God. And so four, four keys to unlocking the peace of God. Believing the right way. Making sure that our beliefs are grounded in the Word of God. Praying the right way. 
Number three, thinking the right way. And then number four, and certainly not least of importance, but living the right way. Guarding the way that we live. Making sure that as far as we know, we're living consistently in a way that is honoring to the Lord. If there is anything in our lives that we are consistently living in disobedience to God's word, we need to forsake it. We need to flee and repent of that sin if we're going to experience God's peace. Well, in closing, uh, I just want to leave you with this thought that none of, none of those following keys are going to make any difference in your life if you have not first received what I call the master key. Sometimes in large buildings they will have what is called a master key. And that key unlocks all the doors in the building. The master key is absolutely necessary in order for you to experience the peace of God. Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in order to experience the peace of God, we must first have the peace with God. He says, therefore, we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So to be justified means to be made right with God. We are all born as sinners. We don't become sinners. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that we are all sinners. We are all sinners. We are all by nature sinners. We sin against God and therefore we must be forgiven. So to have the master key in your life means that you have experienced justification. You have been made right with God. You are no longer an a enemy of God, but you are now a child of God. Because by faith, you have accepted what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. He died on the cross for your sin as God in flesh. He paid your sin debt. He, he took on the wrath of God in your place. We deserve that wrath. But Jesus Christ, His great love for us, died in our place. And on the third day, He rose again. And so the Bible tells us, any who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So tonight, perhaps the underlying reason in your life that you don't have any peace in your life, you don't have any hope in your life, is because you don't have peace with God. And so the Bible says, behold, today is the day of salvation. Cry out to the Lord. Acknowledge your guilt to the Lord. Confess your need for Jesus Christ and trust in Him. And then you will begin that wonderful journey of walking after the Lord and you will experience the peace of God in your life as He grows you as a child of God. Let me pray. Lord, we thank You, Father, that is Your children. You tell us not only can we have peace with God, we can be made right with God by accepting Jesus Christ personally as our Lord and Savior. But as children of God, those who belong to you by faith, as we go through life, and oftentimes life is difficult and it is hard, but no matter what we go through, we can have joy and we can have peace that will guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would take the truth that we've learned tonight about these four keys. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you apply these keys to our lives so that we can walk in peace. And as we walk in peace, we'll have joy. And it'll be a joy that is inexpressible. It'll be a joy that uh, will be witnessed by the lost world around us so that they too ask how they can experience that peace as well. Lord, we give you this week, we pray that as we begin a new week, that we would look to you for our strength. Well, we do pray for healing upon our land. We pray for those who have, have uh, already been infected. We pray for your hand of mercy to be upon them. 
for all of our doctors, Lord, and the physicians. Thank you so much for their service, and we pray for them. Lord Jesus, we, we pray that you would bring this to a quick end. But Lord, above that, as much as we would love to see that, we pray that your will would be done, that your purpose would be accomplished through this, that we not waste this opportunity. Lord, we love you. We thank you for speaking to us through your word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before uh, we close, I again want to thank you for joining us uh, tonight, whether you are a church member here at First Baptist Church or perhaps you live in another part of the country. We, we are grateful to have you join us. Uh, all of our services are being recorded, and we will have those services posted on our website, so you can go back and you can listen to these um, again. Um, this coming Wednesday night, we will have a prayer service at 6.30 that will be put on Facebook Live again. Also, Adam, Pastor Adam Souls, our youth minister, he is going to be having something for our youth as well. He'll be communicating with the uh, youth through Instagram, so know that that will be available for uh, the youth. Uh, church office, again, is open Monday through Thursday from 9 to 3. We are here for you. We want to minister to you. We want, we're going we're gonna to make it through this church. We're going to make it through it by, by clinging to, to one another. So if you have a need or you know of a need, please let us know. And then finally, this morning, I, I know that I mentioned the importance of giving. Now, that is so vitally important that we continue to be faithful in our giving. But one thing that I failed to mention is, is that uh, we are in the midst of having our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We want to continue that so that we can support the missionary efforts through the North American Mission Board right here in North America. We want to continue getting the gospel out into uh, North America. And so pray about that, how you will give to that ministry. On our online giving, there is a, there is a uh, section there if you would like to give to Annie Armstrong that's been made available to you. So again, thank you for joining us tonight. hope that you have a blessed evening. May we all keep our eyes focused on the Lord and may we love one another. Stay in contact with one another. We need one another during these difficult days. Thank you and God bless you.